Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Carl Braganza. I'm head of the uh, climate monitoring section at the Bureau of Meteorology in Melbourne. And really what I'm going to talk about today is a bit more of a broader context of observations of climate change and variability over Australia. And really what I'm going to do today in, in the short 10 minutes I've got to speak is really try and set a context for that background climate change um, to, to, to frame what, what Scott will talk about and what Darren's just talked about. So I've got a couple of slides just to, just to I guess, frame this, this observational evidence for change over Australia. And the first point I want to make is it, it's commonly perceived in the general public, not just in Australia, around the world, that we really look to the 20th century observations to determine the risk of future climate change. And actually, that's not, not very accurate at all. Um, if we're talking about the risk of rapidly doubling atmospheric CO2, so over 200 periods, and what's the risk of doubling um, um, atmospheric CO2 over that period, the fundamental evidence comes from physics and chemistry and from the geological record. So if we were to approach this in a standard risk assessment, the way medicine approaches risk, the way engineering approaches risk, and the way mostly we, we, we approach risk, our null hypothesis would be that altering atmospheric chemistry is unsafe and we've got to prove it's safe before we do it. And right off the get-go, we have enough evidence from the fundamental science to basically say it's unsafe. So if this was a drug, based on that evidence, before we looked at the observations, it wouldn't make it onto the market. Unfortunately, for, pollu for pollution, any type of pollution, we've generally assumed the first null hypothesis, that it's safe, we can do it until someone else proves it's unsafe. And that has led to a very strange situation in the science where we've got really no evidence that it's safe, but we continue to assume that it is, and we've got a vast amount of evidence assuming that it's unsafe, and we ignore that. And so this, by scientific definition, really, releasing 3.6 billion tonnes of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, it's an uncontrolled experiment. We have no idea really how dramatic that, that is going to be, except from, from the modelling that we've done. So that's, that's point of context one. Point of context two is that when we're looking at these extreme events, Again, we're not looking at these to prove or disprove climate change. We're really looking at them to understand how much climate change is already affecting the climate system. In terms of proving and disproving climate change, that work's been done. There's four volumes of the IPCC over two decades, thousands of research papers that really has locked down that the observations, the warming that we've seen, we're already seeing the influence of greenhouse gases. So when we see these, these extreme natural events, what we naturally ask is, well, are we already seeing even further advanced evidence of, of an anthropogenic influence on climate? And so what is that evidence over Australia? Well, what's been attributed to greenhouse gases over Australia is this steady rise in Australian temperatures. So mean Australian temperatures, looking at various modelling scenarios, looking at what we understand of the science, we've really determined that those rise in temperatures is, is most likely due to greenhouse gases and very, very unlikely due to natural variability alone. In terms of extremes, what we've also seen is that we've, had, we've set fewer cold records over the last 60 years, and decade after decade, we break more warm records. And that's what that graph in the middle is. It's basically the number of heat records that have been set per unit of time since 1960, and you can see that that's going up. So how do we understand these, these emerging extreme events in terms of future climate? And my example here, the black line up there is the actual observed real world. The, gr the red line is a physical model run in the Northern Hemisphere that knows nothing about the 20th century except greenhouse gas forcing. And as you can see, it tracks pretty well. The black line there is the European heat wave of 2003. It cost 30,000 deaths and $1.2 billion. You can see that the model gets heat waves as well. As well. It doesn't get them at the same time. Um, but it, it, it's able to replicate these, these um, extreme events. And you can see the progression of changes going into the future if you don't mitigate greenhouse gases. What's salient about that, I guess, if my animation's going to work, is that that extreme event basically becomes an average climate in about 35 years' time. And then what if we go into the future? It's basically a cold day in about 60 years if you don't mitigate against climate change. And really, this is, this is my way of illustrating what an extreme event now means into the future. So we had our own quite deadly heat wave um, back in 2009, which is the, the week leading up to the Black Saturday bushfires across southeastern Australia. 
And really this is to emphasise that just the small shifts that we've seen now actually have a dramatic impact. So what we got was, I think I'm pointing this the wrong way, we had a 46.4, which is a, a shift in our record temperature in Melbourne. We had a week before that of about three days, I think, above 42, which we've never seen before. And basically associated with that, most people understood we got 173 deaths from the bushfires. What is less appreciated is we got 374 deaths from extreme heat from that week leading up into, to this event. And that just represents a small shift in, in, in the mean climate. So if we're looking at the risk in the future, it's actually a huge risk. And I'm not sure that this has been, been properly appreciated you know, out there in the general public. Now, just in the 10 minutes I've got, I'm, I'm quickly coming to what we've experienced over 2010, 2011. And as Darren said, during a La Nina event, what you typically, typically get is warmer water around Australia. What we got in 2010 was warmer water around Australia, but you can see there's also a background warming in sea surface temperatures and during 2010, we had highest on record temperatures by some margin in some regions, very, very, uh, shattering the record in regions that we know are very important to Australian rainfall from our seasonal prediction models, particularly across the north of Australia and off the northwest shell. So what did that lead to? And this is where Darren was talking about, we're not talking about just what climate change led to, we're talking about what the La Nina combined with warming sea surface temperatures, combined with a warming atmosphere, led to in 2010, 2011. Well, if I can go back, what we got was record spring rainfall by some margin across most of eastern Australia. And in terms of the average number of heavy rain days, it was up there with the previous uh, two very strong La Nina events. In terms of, we broke a lot of rainfall records though around the country during this time. Um, Darwin said it's wettest day on record with 367 millimetres. You know, that's a fair slab, probably over a third of southeastern Australia's rainfall in a single day. And they broke uh, wettest, wettest week, wettest month, all in, all in February, basically. Um, tropical cyclone Yasi went through. I don't think we can attribute the strength of Yasi directly to climate change. It was certainly um, consistent with a very strong La Nina. Um, but again, all these things are in the mix together. Um, we got doubly average rainfall around Brisbane, leading to flooding. We still got a heat wave in Sydney, record heat wave, record um, um, overnight temperatures. Victoria, we got flooding in September, October, January, February, consistent with the La Nina, um, but, but very extensive and repeated. Southwest WA, driest year on record, um, periods of extreme heat in, in stark contrast to the rest of the country, which I will talk a bit more about. And we've got flooding in Carnarvon as well. And I think that's where I've ended it. We, we could go on and it'll get a bit tedious from this point in. But that was the rainfall we got. Now, I go around the country a little bit and talk, and, and during, during this time, it's, it, it would be remiss of me not to talk about drying trends and drought. And I think when we get these good years of rainfall, it's fantastic for Australia. We actually rely on it for agriculture, um, as Scott will go into. But uh, I'm finishing up with this slide. The drying trends that are emerging across Australia are somewhat consistent with climate change. Rainfall is a very difficult variable to work with in terms of understanding cause and effect. And there's influences from ozone, there's influences from aerosols or dust and, and other particles in the atmosphere. But what we've really seen is a reduction across <coughs> southern Australia in wintertime rainfall. And so that's in this region here and this region here, particularly in early autumn and winter, consistent with, with some of our modelling. And I'll finish on the impact of that. Losing that autumn rainfall um, in, in an arid climate like Australia, which really primes the catchment for, for subsequent stream flow and, and storage, we've got about a 15 to 20% reduction in autumn and winter rainfall. It's led to about a 60% reduction in stream flow. And if we look at Perth's um, rain, uh, uh, water storages, you can see 2010 there, where they pretty much got nothing into their dams during 2010, which is an unprecedented event in the middle of a really strong La Nina. So I might leave it there and, and Scott can take it up.